If you pick the ball cleanly off the grass, then you've lost 25 to 30 yards on your iron shot because the golf shaft was not allowed to bend as a reaction to taking the divot. And that's how the irons are designed. Not taking a divot is probably the key fault with a lot of golfers. They say to me, they don't want to hit the ground first six inches behind the ball. Well, I don't want you hitting the ground first either. And that's where we work with them and train them to hit the back of the ball. Imagine if you're out there fishing with a fly rod, your fishing pole is going to have a lot of whip to it. It's like a catapult. It's not a firm, stiff fishing pole. It actually has to bend and it kind of flips the line out there. Well, that's what the shaft of the iron does. The shaft bends with an iron and it catapults the ball out there as a reaction to taking the divot. You know, you hit the back of the ball first, your weight's left on your left foot about 80% because you've uncocked the hands down to the ball. The ball is on the club face, it spins upwards a little bit and the golf club cuts through the turf just to the left of the ball. That's divot 101. This is Randy Glay from McKinney, Texas and I play golf at El Dorado Country Club. This is Golf Smarter number 913. Your irons are actually designed to be a digging tool. With Ben Alexander. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Ben. Hello, Fred. Great to be with you. It's been a long time, and, you know, in our pre-interview, you kind of reminded me that we sat face-to-face -face together back in 2006, back at Poppy Hills, and I was like, no, 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 we did this on the phone. You're like, I said, we use Skype, and you said, I've never used Skype in my life. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what it was, so but, I, but I remember, remember the interview we did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for remembering and I wish I could, but you know, that was episode 27 of Golf Smarter. Again, we did the, we sat down in June of 2006, so it's been My quite gosh, a while. Now you've done 900 or so, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, you're going to be episode 914, my friend. My gosh, time flies when you're having fun. Well, are you having fun? Yeah, I tell you, we love golf. I mean, it's it's a sport for a lifetime for all of us, and it's it's really good good to hear your voice and to reconnect with you and all your all your listeners too. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. So, um, you spent so many years at Poppy Hills, and like all of us, we age just a touch. But you know, as long as we're here to talk about it, this is good stuff. And now you're up in uh, in the mountains in Northern California, and you're still teaching. Yeah, yeah. I moved from Monterey. Uh, you know, it got pretty expensive. You know, toward the uh, yeah. latter part of my career, and uh, it's it's just amazing now. The Bay Area, where you know you guys live, and where I lived, and up here, I'm up at the uh, near Mount Shasta, um, and I've been up here for just a few years. I'm teaching still, uh, just part time at the Lake Shasta Inn Golf Resort, uh, doing a few days a week and keeping my head in the game. And uh, there's a lot of golfers up here. It's really fun because it's a golfing resort community and uh uh but it's different being in the mountains because we have fires and we have four seasons up here compared to the the overcast in monterey <laughs> four seasons and we're not talking about the singing group you actually have four seasons of weather versus monterey yeah, getting yeah. two seasons basically so exactly exactly you know one of the things that and this is what i love about this podcast is there are things even from early days of my lessons with, uh, with instructors on this show, I, I still repeat and say it regularly because when I play golf, I'm always walking. And I walk at a brisk pace. And sometimes my friends are like, hey, man, don't you want to talk? And like, yeah, come on, let's go. And they're like, well, we can't keep up with you. Like, you know what? I, I learned early on, walk fast swing slow. <laughs> you remember that. <laughs> oh my, I repeat it to this day and I always give yeah. you credit for it. <laughs> and, 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 uh, gosh, I, and I've heard that so much in my life. And uh, I'll tell you where that came from. Uh, John Geertsen, who you might know, uh, John was um, uh, the um, uh, the head professional at Monterey Fitness, the country club for 24 years. And he was a head pro at Poppy for nine years. And John is my very dear friends, uh, is still alive and is my mentor. 
Um, and when we used to run the golf clinic, Pebble Beach Golf School, the original golf school in Pebble Beach at Poppy Hills, um, John, that was his mantra. And uh, he always said, walk fast and swing slow and don't get it mixed up. <laughs> and, it was, and, and that was a slogan of, of our operation down there. And, and uh, if you think about it, walk fast on the golf swing for, or walk, walk fast on the golf course and then kind of swing slow and don't get them mixed up. Absolutely right. Let's dig into it, though. Let's talk about the value of swinging slow, because um, recently I have discovered that, especially on my, my takeaway, on the backswing, I have a tendency to go too fast. And when I'm able to consciously slow that down, hopefully unconsciously slow that down, I strike the ball much better. Yeah, and, and, and that's so true because um, if you watch the LPGA Tour players, I taught an LPGA Tour player, uh, her name is Danielle Makapani, and she won, uh, I think she won eight times in the LPGA, wow. and she's uh, kind of semi-retired now. But uh, uh, when you watch LPGA Tour players, they hit the ball a long way, but their swing is so fluid, and it's much slower than the men on tour. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, when we grew up as kids, you know, they always said, uh, take it back low and slow. And, and, and I disagree with that totally because, you know, there's, if you took it back low and slow, slow on the takeaway and your follow throughs uh, fast, then you have two tempos in your golf swing. Mm. And um, what I teach is to have the same tempo back and the same tempo through. Um, so many people that I taught and still do teach that they get really, really fast with their arms. And they have the lower body kind of gets stagnant and they don't turn quite as well. So they become an arm swinger. And what happens is it can throw the whole swing out of balance. It can not square the club face up. And what I do, what I do with the tempo of the golf swing is I have a person do a little verbal drill that I give them where I have them say out loud a, a tempo drill. And it would be like one 1,000 on the back swing and two 1,000 on the follow through. So it'd be like, one one thousand, two one thousand, one one thousand, two one thousand, and when I have them say it, Fred, what they do is they can hear the rhythm, they can hear the tempo. Mm -hmm. Now, are you a uh, advocate or uh, a student of the three to one tempo? Um, I know John Novosel of Tour Tempo did a lot of research, and it was backed up by Yale University about the right. yeah the the three to one rhythm tempo. Um, and tempo and rhythm seem to have different explanations when you're talking about a golf swing. Um, yeah. Uh, but I know if I'm like, if I were to go, if my follow through on my swing was the same tempo as the backswing, I'd probably hit the ball about 18 feet. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> am I yeah. going too slow on my backswing here? <laughs> Well, and it's very possible because what happens, everybody's golf tempo is different because we're built differently, you mm -hmm. know, and everybody's rhythm is going to be, everybody's rhythm is going to be different. Um, what, what I try and do is I try and get um, um, a, um, uh, a rhythm to where people can feel fluid in their golf swing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, uh, to where they can start to feel um, uh, the tempo and, and, and be able to, to uh, feel comfortable with their balance and to feel comfortable with their overall tempo of their golf swing. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, you mentioned ago about being an arm swinger. Are we, uh, I, 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 have, I see people have a tendency that they rotate at the shoulders, not necessarily at the waist. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. it does. It does. And um, a lot of people get, um, uh, flat footed on their golf swings. You know, when, when you watch beginners a lot, what you'll see is you'll see their, 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 their right foot as they make their backswing is planted on the ground. But when they make their follow through, if you look at their right foot, it's still flat footed on the ground, you know, mm. and they're not finishing up on the right, they're not finishing up on the right toe and their right knee at the target. And um, uh, so if you think about it this way, if you put a spike through both of your feet, and on the follow through, if there's a spike through your right foot and it's 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 planted on the ground, you're making your follow through with your arms and shoulders and your upper body. And that's what we call it arm swing. And, and you see that. I'm sure you've seen it where beginners do that a lot. And um, uh, what it does, it wrenches your lower back, first of all, because you're trying to create rotation, you know, on the follow through and your right foot's planted and locked on the ground. So 
the, the, the body turn is the feet, knees, hips, and shoulders. You know, the shoulders rotate to the right. And uh, we used to teach, I, I still teach, you know, the belt buckle turns to the right or your tummy button and, and, and your, your knees work. And then on the follow through, you reverse that to the left, you know, where your right knee drives through and you finish up on the right toe with your chest, tummy, and the right knee at the target. And big key here is, is that you want to stay on that spine tilt. You know, when you get that address position, uh, you get that spine tilt and you want to maintain that where your shoulders turn and your hips and, and that's called the turn in, in PGA school, it's the feet, knees, hips, and shoulders. And so many people that I teach and see and beginner golfers and, and, and veteran golfers have been playing for 20 years. They swing flat footed on the right foot. And next time you're out in the golf course, watch that they'll swing flat footed. The arms pull through to the left and oftentimes they'll fall backwards, you know, as, as they yep. come through and they have very poor balance. Yep. I was guilty of that for a long, long time. It took me a while to figure Boy. out that one. And, and it's and, hard on the back. You wonder, you, you yeah, want exactly. back problems. That'll give you back problems right there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I frequently talk about how when I learned how to quiet my lower body, um, that a lot of my back pain subsided. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, there's, there's a great drill that you, you can do for that, you know, when people are arm swingers, and so many people are, that you put a golf club kind of in, you, you hold the golf club in your hands with your palms facing towards you, kind of hands crisscrossed, and you bring the golf club all the way up by the tip of your shoulders and when your arms flat down on your chest. So what you've done is you've taken the arms out of the scenario completely because your arms are up on your chest. You're holding the golf club on your tip of your shoulders. And what you do is you tilt forward, get your address position like a shortstop with a baseball, and you make rotation to the right. And then you follow through to the left toward your target and see if you're finishing up on your right toe. And if you're not, then you realize that it's pretty much an arm swing. And it, it, that helps you develop a body rotation the arms are really important in the swing. You know, the term golf swing means the arms swing back and the arms swing through. That's the swing part of the golf swing. And the turn is the rotation back and rotation through. And when those two things get disconnected, that's what causes people with irons and, 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 and the woods to really not square the club face up at the impact. That's a huge problem we see. And I've seen it in all my teaching career. Hmm. Listen, we're going to take a time out. We'll be back right after this. Ben, you just mentioned a minute ago about spine tilt. I want to I want to dig into that a little bit more. And we're, let's just focus on being a right-handed golfer. And I sorry to all the left-handed golfers, but you've been doing this most of your golfing career, trying to translate this from one side to the other. But uh, for a right-handed golfer, when you talk about spine tilt, um, let let's take that through step by step, starting at address and what you're describing. Well, the spine tilt is is actually hinging from the hip joints. Uh, your you know your hips have a ball socket in there, and they, they 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 you know if you tilt forward, you know the the ball socket in your hip is 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 moving. And um, so uh, you know what you can do to kind of feel that you take your stance, which is about shoulder width apart, and your left foot turned out, and stand nice and tall, hold on to a, to an iron and kind of put it in your waist, and don't bend the knees at all. Keep the legs locked to start. And what you do is you tilt forward and your backside kind of pokes out and your spine tilts forward. And then you bend the knee, uh, bend the knees with a nice knee flex, very much like a shortstop does in baseball. But uh, the, the, the topping the ball that so many people do, Fred, is that uh, it, it's a big problem is they raise the spine up. And the spine tilt is, is, is the key. And when you tilt the spine forward from the hip joints, and you put the club in your waist and you kind of just push it in and you, you lock your legs, tilt forward and your backside goes out and your spine tilts forward. And then you bend the knees to a slight knee flex. And um, maintaining a spine tilt is staying down to the golf shot. A golf shot. And as you know, so many people, what do they do on a missed shot? Beginners and also veteran players, they top the golf ball. And if your spine raises up as you make the backswing and or the follow through, if your spine raises up, the golf club you're holding on to in your hands is going to raise up with you. And that's why I'll, so many people top the golf ball. Mm, that's huge. 
what, what do people say? Well, Charlie, uh, you know, you lifted your head, you took your eye off the ball. And, um, and it's not uh, taking your eye off the ball. If your spine tilt raises up, that's a huge cause for topping the ball. And it's not, it has nothing to do with looking at the ball and taking your eye off the ball. Um, I used to do exhibitions, and I did one up at Hagen Oaks uh, years ago where I would purposely top a golf ball for somebody. And I purposely topped the ball. And what I did was as I came through the shot, I just raised up a little bit. I know where to raise up where I can top it. And I look at the audience. I say, hey, folks, uh, what does somebody in your group on Sunday say when you top a ball like that? And somebody (laughs) in the group is going to say, this is so much fun. Somebody in the group is going to say, oh, you you looked up. You took your eye off the ball. So what I do is I bring that. (laughs) Yeah. so So I bring this guy down from the stands. I take my dress position like I'm going to hit my seven iron and I'm getting all ready. I mean, I, and I got this guy standing right in front of me. And what I do is I lift my head straight up and look him straight in the eye. Now, my spine isn't raised up. All I did was just looking at this guy. I hit a beautiful shot, take a divot, the ball flies up, and the guy's scratching his head. Well, that's what everybody says. They looked up, and I'm looking right at this guy. And I explained about the spine angle raising up is that's what causes it, but if you think about it, nine out of ten new golfers and a lot of golfers that play on weekends say, "Gee, you looked up, took your took your eye off the ball, you lifted your head." It has nothing to do with it. It's a spine angle. Interesting. Now, what about a spine tilt um, at a dress, tilting like uh, away from the target? So again, uh, towards your back foot, um, yeah, dressing yeah. the ball. Tell me your feelings. Your teaching about that position. Well, that happens naturally, Fred, when you take your dress position and when you tilt your spine forward and you bend your knees and you get yourself in that ready position, when you grip the golf club for a right-handed golfer, when your right hand drops below the left, you know, which is for a right-handed golfer, your right shoulder naturally tilts to the right because your right arm is going lower than your left arm. Mm. And that's why you're and that's why your shoulder, your right shoulder for a right-handed golfer, tilts a little bit to the right, and the spine tilts a little bit to the right because the right hand drops underneath. If you thought about, if you gripped your golf club on your grip and both of your hands were even, even, then your shoulders would be level. But because your right hand goes underneath your left, you know, to grip the golf club, the right shoulder naturally tilts to the right. And, and, and that's, that, that's what happens with that. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. And the it, spine tilts a little bit with it, too. Right. But then do you want uh, on your follow through, shouldn't you have your weight shift be more to the front, to your forward foot, even though yeah, you're yeah, you're a little yeah. bit tilted back because your hand is coming underneath there. But you still, you don't want to you don't want to finish your swing again. That, that could be like lifting, you know, straightening out your spine, but you don't want to end your swing uh, with your weight shift back on your right foot or your back foot, because that's going to have a tendency to scoop, try to scoop the ball, right? Yep, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And when, when you hit an iron, um, you know, the or a driver, you know, um, or a three-wood or a hybrid, you know, when you start off, your weight is 50-50, you know, and 50-50 on both feet. You know, the spine is tilted forward, the right shoulder tilts a little bit to the right, and it's very slight, but the right hand drops underneath the left on the grip. But when you're coming through to make impact with an iron, uh, there is a weight shift to the left. And as you make your backswing, there's a little weight shift to the right. And as you make your follow through at impact, not on follow through, but at impact, you're going to have about 80 percent of your weight on your left foot and your left leg and your left side at impact. Then as you follow through, you follow through up in your right toe with your right knee facing the target. And that's what you see on TV with the tour players. But the golf swing, my mentor always said, the golf swing is where rotation with a little bit of weight transfer. And what golfers do is when they're stuck on the right foot and the right foot's planted on the ground like we were talking earlier, and they try and hit a driver or a three-wood or they try and hit an iron, their weight being planted on the right foot shifts to the right and it never shifts to the left. And that's, that's oftentimes why they hit up and, as you said, scoop the ball or oftentimes hit the ground first before they hit the ball they're hitting the big ball before the little white ball mm-hmm. right and, and they don't have a weight around. transfer right yeah exactly exactly right. and then at that point if they're flat footed and there's no turning and weight transfer 
that's where the arms get get really fast, and that's what we call an arm swinger. Mm-hmm. Okay, God, I love getting into the like the basics of a golf swing here because we, you know, sometimes we just forget about talking about that um, because we're like, oh, we're so sophisticated. But then let me ask you: now we're we're really breaking down a basic golf swing here. Um, the left leg on your backswing. I've seen people have a tendency for that left knee or the forward knee to be pointing behind them, uh, or to, when I say behind them, I mean looking down the line of the ball. So the left knee will, will go in, or the forward knee will go in, and they, uh, they'll go up on their toes on that backswing. Yeah, right? yeah, with the left foot. Right, where some teachers will say that you want to keep that knee uh, not pointing back, but maybe pointing towards the ball down low, keeping the feet, the left foot down, and some now there's talk of of letting that uh, forward heel come up. What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, at your desk position, you know, your knees are flexed and the spine's tilted forward like we talked earlier. Um, to, to create rotation to the right, beginners oftentimes come all the way up on their left foot, up on the toe, like a ballerina dancer. And uh, I, I'll, I'll stop them when I see that. And I'll say, hey, look at your left foot. And I'll say, well, what size feet do you have? Well, I got a size 10 shoe. Well, you just came up 10 inches on your left toe which can cause your upper body to also raise up as your left foot's raising up in the air. If you're raising up, you're going to go up with your spine. And so what, what my belief is, and when I taught on the tour and, and when I teach any player, the left knee never pokes out toward the golf ball as you're trying to turn to the right because it, it won't let you move that way. It won't let your hips turn. So what the function of the left knee is on the backswing, Fred, is that the left knee moves away from the target, which would be to your right, not out, but it moves to the right. It moves away from the target, and on the follow-through, the left knee moves toward the target. It never moves out and pokes out away from you. And that happens oftentimes when golfers come all the way up on their left toe. Um, growing up and playing golf in, in, in many, many years ago as a young person, when I started playing at 12, that's what the tour players were doing. If you look at Nicholas's swing back in the 50s and 60s, a lot of those players back then came all the way up on their left toe to try and make the backswing. But you don't see that on the tour in the last 25 years. What they do is they kind of roll on their left foot and keeps the balance and keeps them down to the golf ball. When you start popping the foot up, left foot, that can cause upper body to raise up as well. So what I teach is... The left knee moves away from the target on the backswing. You kind of roll on your left foot, and you turn the shoulders and the belt buckle and the and the hips, and your knees kind of work in in, in 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 with the left knee moving away from the target. On the downswing, the right knee drives toward the left knee, and then you follow up on the right toe with your right foot. And there's a lot of parts I'm talking about there, but it's it's basically feet, knees, hips, and shoulders have a function, and um, when that club is up in your shoulders and you take the arms out of the scenario, oftentimes people don't really know what to do. And sometimes you have to t develop the turn with the motor skill activity, which takes a lot of repetitive action. Repetitive action. Hmm. We're going to take another time out. When we come back, and we're going to move up the body to the chest and the arms. And we'll do that right after this. Okay, Ben. So now that we've we've got the lower body, we've got the position, we've got the weight shift, we've got the spine angle. Um, I want to get your thoughts about something that we've talked about a lot here on the show. We had a, a teacher, uh, Tony Manzoni, out of uh, College of the Desert, Southern California area, um, who's no longer with us, and we miss him terribly. He was a great, great uh, friend of Golf Smarter. And he used to talk about something that he witnessed or, you know, studied from Ben Hogan's videos and swings and writings. And then I recently saw Gary Player talking about the same thing, and that is about the left bicep staying attached to your left chest through the swing. 
Um, I've, yep. I've been really mm-hmm. trying to focus on that recently and have been hitting the ball much better when I just know that I'm, I'm rotating my chest and keeping my left arm attached to my chest as I'm rotating my body and then following through. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, that's a great point because if you take your address position over the golf ball and your your chest is basically pointing at the ball, um, when you make your rotation back, the chest turns away from the target as you're hinging your hands, and the left arm and the bicep is connected to the chest as it makes movement back. If it, if the left arm starts moving out from your body and the arms are moving out and away, you're not hinging the golf club up. So I agree 100% with that, that uh, what I teach is on the on the backswing, your ball is, uh, your your chest is facing at the golf ball. As your back, you make your backswing, your chest turns to the right, faces away from the target. And on the follow through, your chest follows through toward the target and faces the target. But as that backswing happens, when your chest turns away from the target, your, your arms are moving backwards and the bicep yeah should be attached to your body kind of touching your chest body area and as your hands are hinging so if the left arm moves out away from your body then that throws the whole swing out of plane Hmm. so i agree with that completely wow and then but now let's let's step into a bunker here and um i'm trying to you know like you kind of open your body on a bunker shot let's we'll talk about greenside bunkers um, you, you're opening your body a bit, right? And so it makes it harder because if you keep your arm attached there, all of a sudden you're pulling the ball a lot off the line that you're trying to get to. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and in, in, in a bunker, uh, you know, when I do bunker lessons, uh, I'll, I'll have a person set up to the ball square, you know, to start with, you know, with the, the sand wedge, you know, actually touching the sand, you know, so they can kind of get a feel of where the club is at. And I'll set it up square with the target line and the feet. And then what I'll do is I'll draw a line with the back of my golf club next to the golf ball, have an arrow pointing at the target, you know. So I draw a line uh, next to the golf ball on the outside of the ball with an arrow facing the target. And then what I'll do is I'll draw – a line with the stance open in the stand in the sand. So the stance is open about 30 degrees. So both Mm. the toes are kind of open. And uh, I I teach to play the ball in the center of the stance. So I use a lot of visual when I'm doing a bunker lesson. So I've got a line next to the ball arrow in the sand, you know, pointed at the target. And I'll say, this is where we're trying to go. I have the stance open very, very slightly. And what I do is now next, I draw a line in the sand directly behind the golf ball, about two or three feet. And it's about two inches behind the ball. So they've got a little target line. They can see where the stance is open a little bit. And then the line is directly behind the ball. And the line directly behind the ball is where you're trying to make impact in the sand. You're not trying to hit the ball. It's the only shot in golf where you never make contact with the ball itself. You hit the sand. And so that's what I do is I'll draw lines in the sand visually Uh, So a student can see that. And then I'll rake the sand up, you know, so I have them set up to it without the lines. And then uh, I always draw a line behind the ball so they can see the impact point. But, yeah, the stance is open to the left a little bit. Uh, uh, You want to keep your weight on the left foot, left leg, left foot, about 80 percent at the address position and also at impact. There's not a lot of weight transfer in the bunker because when you start transferring the weight to the right, that oftentimes moves people off the ball. And what we see is they'll hit the sand fred, you know, with the sand wedge, four, five, ten inches behind the ball in the sand. And and that's that that we don't want a big weight transfer in the bunker. It's a pretty simple shot. But when I'm teaching, I'll draw that line next to the ball, a little arrow, draw a line behind the ball, and then have a the stance open about 30 degrees so they can kind of see where their setup is. And uh, but you still want that driving the right knee through it's not a dead leg shot it, it's not an arm shot it's 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 cocking the hands and it's a little bit of a uh hitting down on the ball uh and and a little bit of a finish facing the target you know it, it, it's a basic golf swing yeah you know 
<laughs> so many of us are working on like, I'm trying to get my swing right. I'm trying to get my swing right. And then you start pulling out different clubs in your bag and realize that it's not the same swing for every club. It's like you, there's so much that you have to think about like, oh, okay, now with this club in this position, I have to do these things where uh, yeah, where I'm teeing yeah. off. It, there's so many different kind of shots that you have to be comfortable making, let alone understand how to and what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, very, very true. And, you, you know, it's, golf is broken down where you have the full swing with your woods and irons, and then you have the short game, which is, you know, putting, chipping, uh, pitching, and, and bunkers. And uh, that's the great thing about the sport. There's a lot of there's a lot of areas of golf, and that's that's where you, you, you need an accomplished uh, uh, PGA professional to help guide you through the, the journey where you kind of t- – Uh, take it in segments where when I do lessons, I do the first few lessons on the range with the irons and then the, the get into the woods. And then after we're comfortable with that, that's, that's a basic golf swing. It's the same swing with the, with the irons and the woods, you know, you're not taking a divot with your driver, of course, but then the short game is two thirds of the strokes on a tour player scorecard. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the short game, uh, when I teach short game at my area up here, I, I teach that the short game is about 30 yards away from the green. That's where it kind of starts. And um, if you're 30 feet off the green or 10 feet or 30 yards or 20 yards, it's certainly not a full swing. And there, there are different swings and, and things in golf. And when you and I get out in the golf course, like when I talked to you the other day, I know you play, we're playing golf and, and you get a lot of things thrown at you. And the cool thing about golf is that you only hit your driver 14 times. Maybe and you got four par. <laughs> yeah, you got four. Well, yeah, <laughs> you got four par threes, and you got you hitting the driver fourteen times, and then. Um, but everybody's working on their driver like ninety percent of the time. Sometimes you know, but um, a driver's not a scoring club. You're just trying to get into position. So you got one swing for the woods and irons. You know, it's a basic swing. You take a divot with the irons, and it's more of a sweeping motion with your driver. And then if you're uh, if you don't hit a lot of greens in regulation, which a lot of players don't, then it's a little it, it, you're in the short game area. And uh, and you certainly have different swings of that. I mean, a, a bunker shot is a little different action. Uh, um, a chip shot's a different shot. A putt's a different shot. Hmm. Um, I have a little formula if I can throw it out at you about Please. the short game that w- when you're within 30 yards from the green, and I always kind of remember the football days when I was younger, you know, 30 yards, 20 yards, 10 yards on the, the hash marks. Uh, if your ball is in that area of 10 yards, 20 yards, um, my formula is put it first, chip it second, and pitch it last. And a, and a, and your putt is always going to be better than, you know, because the, the, you're keeping the ball on the ground. And so many people, even when they're uh, in the fringe, they're, they're chipping the ball when the ball's in the fringe. So I always say, well, putt it as your first choice. If there's no way you can putt it, 10, 20, 30 yards off the green, then it's going to be a chip shot. And that's where you're playing the ball back and stance, uh, play, playing the ball back in your stance a little bit, hands ahead, and you're getting the ball on the green or rolling it up to the hole. That's a chip shot. If there's no way you can putt it or chip it, then it's a pitch with your sand wedge or your lob wedge. And it's not a big swing. It's an adjusted swing. My teacher used to call it a mini golf swing. And if you have to go over a bunker, if you have to chip it over some or pitch it over the rough, uh, so putt it is first choice. If you can't putt it, then chip it. And if you can't chip it and get it on the ground and roll it up to the hole, then the only option you have is a little short little pitch shot, and that would be with a lob wedge or a sand wedge. Putt, chip, or pitch. Right. And what I uh, see so many people doing, and, and based on so many different conversations I've learned, I think, that the goal, uh, getting the ball onto the green, is to get it on the green as soon as possible and let it roll out. And so yeah, often yeah. I'll see people go putt first, pitch second, right? Where yeah. they're, gonna, they're just trying to get the ball to land near the hole, and they don't take into account that it's going to release. You're not going to get backspin on it, folks. I mean, we just don't That's do right. that. And so you don't need to try to get the ball way up in the air. Okay, understand if there's a bunker in the way, if there's you know something that would prevent you from hitting the ball low and letting it roll out. But 
isn't the idea of, and that's why chipping would be second, is you want to get the ball to the ground as quickly as you can so you can let it roll and then work those distances, correct? Yeah, well, well, well said. Well said because because when you're putting a ball, the ball has about 95% forward roll as it comes off the putter. You know, it's rolling to the hole and you're, you're, you're judging and guesstimating how much backswing on a putt or the speed of your putter that you're getting the ball to roll in the hole. And then if you're going to chip the ball, uh, what I teach is I, I teach, you know, just to use a couple of clubs for chipping. Uh, use a seven iron, uh, play the ball off your back foot, narrow the stance, move your hands ahead and do a pendulum stroke, keeping that golf club aimed at the target during the entire motion of the pendulum stroke. Because when you chip a ball with a seven iron, the ball's coming off the club face with about 95% forward roll. It doesn't have backspin. It's got forward roll on it. And you're guesstimating how big or small your stroke is. Um, I, I teach chipping with a seven iron if you have longer distances to roll a ball to the hole. If you got a lot of green to work with, if you've got a tight flag stick and, and you're you're near the flag stick, uh, I teach the chip shot with a sand wedge because the ball comes off with still forward 95% forward roll, but you have slower velocity on it. You know, and, and sand wedge is very effective if you have a short flag. Seven iron is really effective if you've got a longer flag and a lot of green to work with. Um, and, of course, if you do have to do a pitch shot, if you can't do either of those shots, if you've got a lot of rough to get it over, if you've got a sand trap to carry it over, then you do a mini golf swing, just a normal setup, ball in the center, cocking the hands and uncocking the hands, hitting down on the ball. But it's not a big swing, but it's maybe a little quarter swing or a half swing. But so many people mess up their, their golf games because they have lousy short games. And they really don't practice it very, very much because they kind of dabble with it. Well, they say, I'm a pretty good short game player. When I do a playing lesson like I did with a student a few days ago, Fred, um, when we're out on the golf course, like I did a few days ago with my client, um, uh, we, we put a ball over in the area of the green uh, or off the green in the rough. And I say, well, what are your options? Would you chip it from here or put it from here? You make them make the decision. And if they go with the formula, put it, chip it, and pitch it, it always leads them to the correct formula of what they should do around the green within about 20, 30 yards away from the green. Hmm. Wow. Such good stuff. So uh, we have a show called Golf Smarter Mulligans where we go back and, and listen to some of the best of uh, the Golf Smarter episodes that are no longer available. And I bring that up because uh, episode number six of Golf Smarter Mulligans is our very first conversation, our only other conversation that was originally recorded in 2006. So if people are finding what Ben have to say fascinating, it's still available. You can go back to Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode number six, and hear that one. But let's hear what's going on this week with Golf Smarter Mulligans. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, we're graced by one of my favorite guests, Jeff Ritter, in part one of a two-part interview. Jeff has been dubbed as one of Golf Digest's best young teachers in America. And just before we recorded this, he was named the National Director of Instruction at the Nike Golf Schools and Junior Camps. This episode is called, You're Either Learning or You're Performing. And here's what he means. You're either learning or you're performing. At least you should be. So, for example, when you're on the range, uh, you need to take off your performance cap. You need to get entirely into learning mode, which means trying to change the way that you, you move in an environment that is void of worrying about what the outcome is going to be. When you go to the golf course, you may have made those changes on the range, but you're so eager to shift back into performance mode that all that stuff sometimes just falls right apart. Getting from the range to the course is a big mental hurdle for some people. And a lot of times you have to really change in your mind what it means for you to have fun. That's episode 229, part one of our conversation featuring Jeff Ritter on our sister podcast, Golf Smarter Mulligans, being released this Friday morning, originally published in February of 2012. So if you're a fan of Golf Smarter's content, don't miss the chance to get two episodes every week. That's Golf Smarter, golf's longest running podcast, and Golf Smarter Mulligans, episodes from our archives that revisit the best of the Golf Smarter podcast. They're both available for free from wherever you're listening right now. Ben, your advice is spectacular. Thank you so much. Um, 
I do want to bring up something you said a few minutes ago about um, the the hitting the divot with the irons, getting more of a sweeping motion with the woods. Um, but do you still want to have, even though you're not trying to pull a divot out with your woods or your hybrids, do you still want to have the bottom of your swing in front of the ball? Or when you're sweeping through it, are you kind of just coming up behind the ball? Well, with a driver, of course, you've played, the ball with a driver is played forward in your stance uh, off your left heel. And um, the shaft is straight up and down. It doesn't lean to the left or the right. The shaft is straight up and down. The ball's forward. So when you're making your swing with your driver, there still is a weight transfer. You want to get your weight on your left foot about 60 or 80% at impact so you can make the follow through. Um, with a three wood, uh, you, you, you still have the ball position off your left heel. You still want to take a little bit of turf with your three wood because the ball's sitting on the ground. You're not trying to sweep it off the ground. You're trying to take a little, little turf with that. Um, and, and, and of course, with the irons, I teach to play the irons, five iron all the way down through the lob wedge in the center of the stance. Uh, because the arc of the swing with the five iron, six, seven, all the way down to your wedges, the bottom of the arc bottoms out in the center of the stance. Uh, the early days in Nicholas's book, you know, Nicholas's book, Golf My Way, he always said, play all your irons almost off your left heel. You remember those days in his book, Golf My Way? And the golf club did not bottom out off the left heel with a pitching wedge. It bottoms out in the center of the stance. So, um I, I teach three ball positions off the left heel or, you know, off the left heel with the woods. Uh, if you have a hybrid club, like a three or four hybrid or a three or four iron, which is what they are, you play the ball a little forward, but the irons five through the sand wedge, which is what we mostly hit. We play it in the center. And so you're, you're trying to hit down with the irons. You're trying to hit down with the hybrid, but with the, with the driver and the three wood, it's more of a, I don't want to confuse people, but you're actually hitting up on the ball a little bit because the ball's played so far forward off your left heel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to top it. Keep your spine set. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't want to look up. Keep your head down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I've just, I've just come to this realization lately because I've struggled for such a long time with my, um, my five iron and six iron and even sometimes seven iron, but mostly my five iron is that I would get a big slice on it um, and really struggle with getting it on the line that I'm, that I'm trying, that I'm aiming. And just recently I moved the ball a little more forward in my stance and all of a sudden I'm making better contact and hitting it straight again which is yeah, my yeah. goal. So I'm realizing that I had the ball too far back in my stance on a number of my clubs. Right, right, yeah. And um, the five iron down through your sand wedge, if you play the ball generally in the center of the stance, you know, you're trying to square the club up about eight or nine inches on either side of the golf ball. And mm -hmm. um, if you're slicing the ball or pushing it with your iron or your five iron, that means as you're coming into that area of about eight or nine inches on the ball, say bigger 10 inches on either side of the golf ball, if the golf club is open through that area, driver or a five iron, it's going to go off to the right. And if the golf club is closed through that 10 inches on either side of the ball, it's going to go to the left. And a great drill to work on, you know, these training strict, uh, sticks that we all have, you've seen them, you probably have them in your bag, you know, and they've got those uh, you know, the training sticks that you buy at the golf shop and, you keep them in your bag and you see tour pros use them all the time. I have a bunch of them I use in a lesson to Here's a great drill is to get uh, uh, either two of your irons or two of those training sticks, you know, and just put them on the ground about six inches apart from each other. And then take your stance and put your golf club in between those two training sticks without a golf ball and take your stance. You got your imaginary golf ball there. You got your five iron, uh, on the, on the grass, you know, and you're getting ready to do this, make a backswing, backswing and a full follow through at normal speed and see if your golf club clips one of those training sticks. And I can almost guarantee you for a lot of the listeners, it'll clip the in, inside stick, which means the golf club is pulling to the left as you're coming through and it's not square going down the line. It's a wonderful drill to take the ball out of play. 
Wait a minute. Now, now the ball, the sticks aren't pointing down the line of the ball. They're coming f between your legs, right? And you're going. No, 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 no. The, you know, the sticks are on the grass, pointing at the target. They down, are pointing down the driving at the driving range. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And, and, and so, so they're pointing at the target, about six inches apart. You take your address position, uh, and you, you you put your golf club. You know, just grip it and put your golf club touching the grass. And the sticks are pointing toward your target down the driving range. And you're making a swing to where the golf club head is going in between those sticks as you're making your swing. I get it. I get it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. And and, and a lot of tour pros, if you notice, uh, if you're watching them warming up on the driving range, of course, we had the AT&T at Poppy Hills, uh, you know, so many years at Poppy, and gave us a chance to see the players up close. Every player to a to a man on the PGA Tour has those sticks in their bag, and I use them for teaching. Most teaching pros use them with our equipment. And if you hit the stick, the outside stick, the inside stick, that means your swing path is off, and that's going to make a definite difference on where the ball is going to go, right or left. You can take your three-wood, do the same thing like you did with your five-iron, Fred. Put your three-wood in between those two sticks with the sticks pointing down at the target, Take your stance and make your swing with your three wood to see if you're clipping those sticks. And if you're clipping those sticks, your golf club head is not repeating every time going down the line. You should never hit the sticks. You should just brush the grass as you make your full back swing and your full follow through. And when you're coming to the impact, you should never, never clip the sticks with any club in your bag. Great advice. And then. And then here's the other side of that drill. Please. Then you put a golf ball in between. You put a you put a golf ball in between those two sticks. Oh no, and that'll screw up everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, then, and start off with a pitching wedge with the golf ball. You know, uh, shorter distance. But that's how you practice it. You do some practice swings in between the sticks with no ball. Then you put a golf ball in between the two uh, sticks about six inches apart, and you actually hit shots. And if you're clipping the stick then oftentimes a golfer is coming over the top, swinging outside to in, or there's a lot of things that are going awry. They're not repeating their swing. And this little two-stick drill really helps you start developing the consistency of a solid impact. Mm, probably one of the least expensive training aids you can find these days, those two little sticks. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah, really and, helpful. And, and, you know, you, you, you can get them online or at the golf stores. Uh, <laughs> up here, I'll, I'll have people go to the local hardware store to get a couple of the little, you know, the sticks that you might put in the front of your driveway for markers and just throw them in your bag and they're wonderful training tools. Fabulous. Fabulous. Well, you know, you were uh, a 2004 PGA uh, Teacher of the Year, Northern California section. Um, you were also yes. nominated for a PGA Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. That's quite an accomplishment. And so you've given you. thousands, probably tens of thousands of, of lessons, seen tens of thousands of of uh, golf students, what are some of the issues that you've seen that just um, are so common, but people just aren't aware of? Uh, I think I think the biggest thing is is not taking a divot, um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and you know the uh, you know I played uh, uh, Callaway clubs for years. I played Titleist, which I still have in my bag, and. Uh, irons is designed as a digging tool, and um, when when you, when you take a divot, it, when you hit the back of the golf ball, the golf club head actually cuts through the turf a little bit on the left side of the ball, and the ball kind of spins up the club face. It all happens simultaneously together, and as the golf club is cutting through the turf to the left side of the ball, it slows the club head down a little bit. It slows the club head and then it says shaft your turn and the shaft bends and acts like a catapult to catapult the ball out there to give the iron shot a normal distance. If you pick the ball cleanly off the grass or if you pick the ball cleanly off the tee on a par three hole, then you've lost 25 to 30 yards on your iron shot because the golf shaft was not allowed to bend as a reaction to taking the divot. And that's how the irons are designed. And there's been no student I've taught, Fred, over the years that ever wants to hit the ball shorter. <laughs> you know, they all want to hit it farther. <laughs> and not taking a divot 
Um, you know, the, the, the things I hear from students, well, I don't want to hurt my hands because I'm hitting the ground. Well, I don't want you hitting the ground. I want you hitting the back of the ball. But that's where the weight transfer to the left comes in, you know, that we talked about earlier in the show. But um, not taking a divot uh, is, is the probably the key fault with a lot of golfers. And they say to me, they don't want to hit the ground first six inches behind the ball. Well, I don't want you hitting the ground first either. And that's where we work with them and train them to hit the back of the ball. And I do a little demonstration, you know, like imagine if you're out there fishing with a fly rod, your fishing pole is going to have a lot of have a lot of whip to it. It's like a catapult. It's not it's not a firm, stiff fishing pole. It actually has to bend and it kind of flips the line out there. Well, that's what the shaft of the iron does. The shaft bends with an iron uh, and your hybrids uh, all the way down to your wedges. Uh, the shaft has to bend. And it catapults the ball out there as a reaction to taking the divot. You know, you hit the back of the ball first. Your weight's left on your left foot about 80% because you've uncocked the hands down to the ball. The ball is on the club face. It spins upwards a little bit. And the golf club cuts through the turf just to the left of the ball. That's divot 101. Well, you don't take a divot with your driver. It's more of a sweeping motion because the shaft of the driver is so long, it acts like that fishing pole catapulting action on its own. But the irons, hybrid down to your wedges, you've got to make that uh, reaction occur of taking a divot. And and I've got to, can I share a little quick drill with you on that? Oh, I'd love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I call it my impact drill. I learned it from the great teacher, Jim Flick. You know, uh, the Northern Cal PGA, we have a teaching uh, teacher forum every year for two days, uh, usually in Sacramento area. And Jim gave us this, uh, Jim Flick gave us this exercise, he ca- and it's called the impact drill. Take, take your address position with your pitching wedge and get the ball, you know, out in front of you and get yourself all ready to hit it and make a little quarter golf swing, just a little quarter golf swing. Hit the ball and stop the club just past the ball about one foot. So you're taking a little short backswing, cocking your hands up to like a little quarter swing. Drive the right knee into the left, hit the back of the ball, and stop the golf club just past the ball to see if you're hitting down on the ball. And it's a mini swing, and it's called the impact drill. Oftentimes when I give this drill to people, instead of stopping one foot past the ball, they finish all the way up on the with the club over the left shoulder. Well, club over the left shoulder is not not the impact. That's the follow through. So the impact drill actually is a quarter golf swing, and it'll help you to start hitting down on the ball with a weight transfer to the left. Again, it's just cocking the hands to a little quarter swing with the pitching wedge. Uncock the hands, hit the ball with your weight to the left. Stop the ball, stop the golf club. Just pass the ball about a foot. Um, and, and, and that's what it does to actually help you start to feel what the impact should feel like. Then you build the swing up, you know, with your other irons and all that. But if you're starting to top the ball or thin the shot or having ball flight problems, there's no divot. I always suggest to my students on the golf course, do a little impact drill before you hit the shot. Make sure you take a divot because this drill is designed to actually take a divot. And it's a wonderful drill. It's called the impact drill. That is so good. That is so good. Well, you know, for years I've talked about walk fast, swing slow. I've got a new one. I'm going to be quoting you for years. Irons are designed to be a digging tool. There you go. (laughs) Oh, Ben, it's it's so great to reconnect with you and hear you and and get a lesson from you. Your content is so valuable. I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to to, to, to talk to you again, Fred, and you take care of my good friend. So there's a couple things I'd like to share. Um, I'm sure I've repeated this way too often, but I've been a fan of audio content since I fell in love with Boss 40 AM radio in the 1960s, then the rise of Freeform FM radio in the 70s. Now, in my teens, I started creating audio content and have done so on many levels, my entire life, from silly outgoing phone messages, AM and FM radio, corporate audio newsletters, national syndications, audiobooks, all the way through to podcasts. Well, then as technology started changing the game, I also got into creating video content, which I kind of studied in college as well. I've 
always been a one-man shop, rarely delegating tasks, but constantly learning how to improve my many skill sets, which is also my passion, (laughs) kind of like my golf game. Well, this is to say that I still have a lot to learn about my trades, which is why a few months ago, I enlisted the help of an agency to do my video social media posts for Golf Smarter. Even though their approach to content creation is radically different than I would do, I let them run wild, finding and posting excerpts of each Golf Smarter episode and creating short videos and articles. And to my delight, it's working. And working well. There are posts six times each week from these interviews that have had tens of thousands of views. So I invite you to please get the most out of each podcast episode by following at Golf Smarter on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, okay, Twitter, X, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you're comfortable checking LinkedIn regularly, Then follow me, Fred Green from Novato, California, as well, for regular tips, insights, advice, and controversy from the weekly Golf Smarter podcast. Now, as I go through our archives to prepare episodes for Golf Smarter Mulligans, I was surprised to see an episode with Tony Manzoni that I've never included in our annual Tony Manzoni Spring Golf Season kickoff. Now, I can't decide if I want to play it as it comes up in order, or wait until next March and April when we usually do nine consecutive episodes and adding one, or maybe I find more. If you have any thoughts, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I do want to welcome this week's Golf Smarter Ambassador, Randy Glay from McKinney, Texas, where I've actually been and had a great time working at a fan festival in 2005 to kick off the McKinney uh, NBA G League season. Randy, it was for the Houston Rockets. Uh, Randy chose Tony Manzoni's video, The Lost Fundamental, as his gift for participating. And I invite you to join our global team of Golf Smarter Ambassadors by calling our toll-free Golf Smarter listener line so that you, too, can be on the podcast and receive a free gift of your choice. Gifts include Tony Manzoni's video of The Lost Fundamental or a box of Odin X1 balls with the Golf Smarter logo, or a glove and glove storage compartment from redroostergolf.com. I'm going to leave a link in the show notes and on today's blog post, so please write to me, and I'll get back to you with some instructions of what to do and what to say. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for upcoming episodes, DM me on social media or write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com, And then there's always, click on that Hey Fred button when you visit golfsmarter.com.